Good afternoon. This is Robin Kirby Gatto. Welcome to today. It's going to be an awesome day in the Lord. I'm just going to lower this down just a little bit so you can see more of me. And I just pray that you are having an awesome day. I'm so super excited. It is a beautiful day down here in Birmingham, Alabama. And I am just so super excited about the word that God is bringing today. It is just going to strengthen and encourage you. And it is just going to edify you and cause you to abound in grace. Amen. <clears throat> so as you join on, be super hopeful and expectant. Amen. <clears throat> it is going to be a day where we're going to see the Holy Spirit combine different scriptures as he shows us things that are fenced in and hidden, as in 1 Corinthians 2. And he shows us the mind of Christ by revealing the vengeance of our God, right? We know that we do not take in defense and defend ourselves to anyone, but God is our defense, amen? And so as you join on today, you be super excited and know that the Lord is going to encourage you. And I'm just getting a bunch of scriptures Getting a bunch of scriptures, amen. There's a ton of scriptures that Holy Spirit has me doing. And it's so funny because the word of the day is Green's Ward. And it's funny because Ward, W-A-R-D, is the, my maiden name. And it's Green's Ward, and it means a patch of grass. Is that not phenomenal? Because that is what today is going to be. It is going to be totally us in that Psalm 23 where we are in green pastures, amen, and we are beside still waters. So as you join on, you just expect for Holy Spirit to strengthen you, amen, and I'm going to go ahead and enter into the Word of God with prayer. God, we just thank you for the strength of your name. We thank you, God, that you are faithful, that you cause us to be stirred with holy emotions as you give us knowledge and wisdom and understanding, and as you stir us mightily with your power in our inner man to cause us to be rooted deeply, grounded securely in the love of Christ so that we will know the hope to which you have called us and know the love and experience your love towards us and that, God, we will see today you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can think or imagine according to that power and operation inside of us. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you join on, you be super hopeful. And if y'all are saying any things, I can't see anything. So don't think I'm ignoring you. I just, for whatever reason, it's just not letting me see anything. And so we are looking at scripture today, and we're going to be looking at the context of when it is time to leave a place, to leave a season when your peace is disturbed and we're going to also look at those that are persecuted are the real church and we're also going to see God bringing vengeance and what it looks like because as we open up Isaiah 61 you are going to see that it is absolutely phenomenal what the Father has for you and I amen and again, do not think that I'm ignoring you. I can't see anybody. If you're posting, I can't see you posting. So hello to everybody that is joining in. I love you and thank you for joining in. And so let's get into scripture and let's start first and foremost in Matthew 10. And we're going to look at when you are to shake the dust off of your feet. A lot of Christians are confused and you think, that you have that that love is love is tolerating bad behavior and that is not love there are times when god is bringing deliverance to different people and you might be in a marriage you might be in a relationship you might have children and they are going through deliverance of ungodly fruit and they're being pruned and you don't tolerate that behavior you deal with it with love and sometimes there is tough love and there's nothing wrong with tough love and one of the things that I find as a Christian I find that it is difficult for many to use tough love Jesus shows us this tough love in John 2 he doesn't go into the temple and say oh please come together let me just tell you what's on my heart he doesn't do that 
as the scripture states in Psalms, that there would be a jealousy in Jesus Christ for the house of God. That name, Jealous, God's name, Jealous, is expressed in Jesus Christ in John 2. <clears throat> and that's why he goes in with the whip and he removes all the merchandising. He removes the unclean offerings. And he tells people, stop bringing your furniture through the house of God and using it as a shortcut. Everybody had gotten out of the holy, reverential, and worshipful fear of God. And saints, that is where we are today. And I really am totally convinced that we will never see church as the same, that church has changed, it is changing, and that we are to listen to the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean, I'm not saying that church buildings, all the church buildings are going to shut down. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that some will, absolutely, and that some won't. But God is making a shift, and He wants to cause His people to understand the church is the people. It's not the building. It's the people. And in this nation, in the Western world, we have made an idol out of a building. And we have made the building the church, and we have strapped the burden of paying for the building on the people. If you look at the book of Acts, in the early church, they did not rent out the synagogue. They met in each other's homes, and they broke bread daily. Now, a lot of people look at that breaking of bread in the book of Acts as communion. And it might very well have been communion. And also, as I look at the breaking of bread, I don't only look at it as just communion, but I look at it as fellowship and not forsaking the assembly of ourselves. And it doesn't mean assembling to a church building every Sunday. It can be that for some people. But it's not a cookie cutter format. It is not going to be the same for everyone. And so the assembling of ourselves together is going to be in fellowship. And what we're seeing in the United States of America is the shift. And the fellowship has shifted to the homes. And there is more church and the breaking of bread which includes fellowship. And the reason that I'm emphasizing fellowship is because first and foremost, I learned that you can never be angry with someone that you fellowship. You cannot be angry with someone you eat with. If you have emotions or feelings that are bad towards another person, let me tell you what, you eat a meal with that person and whatever you felt before you had a meal with them, it totally fades away. Now, Understand, I'm not discounting Judas, okay? Judas, I am not discounting him, but remember, Jesus already knew what Judas was up to, and Jesus told Judas to leave and go do what he had already planned to do, what was in his heart. He was the son of perdition. And so I'm not talking about that. What I am talking about are those that are in Christ Jesus, in the real church, as we are in fellowship, any areas in our soul where we might have discontent towards another bondservant of the Lord, you're not going to be able to be bothered with them if you eat with them. And so fellowship is not just coming together and listening to the teaching of the word it is also interacting. It is being community. It is. And that's what the first early church was. And I will give you an example that we did for God's Firewall School, the Prophets, which again, all that is is the Word of God 
discipleship Navy SEALs. It does not teach you how to prophesy. It does not teach you how to prophesy. It doesn't talk about the prophets. As in the ancient days, the school of the prophets was the intense study of the word. And for people that are ignorant of what an actual school of the prophets is, they will take it out of context and they will make it all about a gift. And it was never about a gift. It was always about the Holy Scripture, the scrolls, the Word. Amen. And so when we look at fellowshipping, we were led by Holy Spirit as I would set aside one day every month to do an entire day from 10 to 4 teaching of a session of schools that I was breaking down. So let's say when I did the book of Ephesians and I would do nine sessions, nine months. And so once a month for nine months, and I had two different schools that God had me do. God's Bible Healing of the Soul. And that was a Thursday night. And then we also had Isaiah 22, 22. So we were meeting about three times a month, three times a month with those three ministries. But the School of the Prophets was the absolute longest because it was such intense studies and we were just there all day long studying the word and in the middle of our studies we would break and we would come together and we would have fellowship and we would have a covered dish where generally I would make the meat part of the dish and all those coming in attendance would bring other things that would complement the meal and we would just fellowship and we would have such an anointing of the oil of unity, the oil of unity, and it would just be upon us, and we would just have such joy, unspeakable and full of glory. And one of the things that God had me do with the oil of unity, because that's Psalm 133, and I'm going to get into that as well today, because that is a and that is an important part in your Christian walk and for the church is unity. We cannot allow division. That's James 3, 16. We cannot allow strife, contentions, quarrels. That is the fruit of the enemy. That is not the fruit of Holy Spirit. And so one of the things that God had me do to show the all of unity to hopefully a secular arena with my fiction book, Clawing and Gnawing, is at the end when there is an all-out warfare and El Elyon's soldiers, warriors, are all armored up in El Elyon's armor. They are lined up and they are anointed by a prophet. And the anointing that is put upon them for the battle is the oil of unity. The oil of unity. And I'll go ahead and get to Psalm 133 and read that. And just bring explanation of why it is so important to walk in unity. How can you walk with someone unless you walk in unity? That's scripture, right? And so unity is that soundness of mind where we are of one mind, as it says in Ephesians 4, we're of one spirit, we have one Savior, we're of one God, we have one hope. And so that is unity. And the enemy hates unity. As Jesus spoke in Matthew 12, that a kingdom cannot be divided against itself. And so the way that the enemy comes into the church is to bring division. And as I have taught on specifically the spirit of divination, and I'll do that teaching again sometime, the thing that the spirit of divination operates majorly in is divisiveness and it's going to bring in divisions. It's going to have people speak poorly of other people and it's going to have you super paranoid to make you think that you can only trust that one person. And so the spirit of divination does that and it brings divisions in relationships. And so the all of unity is just the opposite. And that brings us into fellowship. Amen. So let's read Psalm 133. And it's the Psalm of Ascents of David. It's three verses. 
and I'm reading the Amplified Classic. Scripture says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like precious ointment. Now, that's what we're hearing at the beginning of verse 1. But now we're going to see an analogy, a proverb of sorts, a parable of how this looks like, right? Because that's what Jesus did. He would teach something and then he would provide a picture which would be in parable format. It is like the precious ointment poured on the head that ran down on the beard of Aaron, the first high priest that came down upon the collar, his, his skirts of his garments, consecrating the whole body. Woo! Do you see that? This is Ephesians 1, 17 through 23, where we see that Jesus is the head of the church and the church is the body and the head fills the body with himself from the lowest part up to the top. And so when we have one mind, when we have unity, we have that 1 Corinthians 2, 16, the mind of Christ that knows the intents and thoughts of the Father's heart, and we're not judging by our own eyesight or our own hearing, but with righteous judgments, like Jesus prophesied about Jesus in Isaiah 11, 3 and 4 and 5, with righteous judgments, we distribute equity. See, we're not, we're no longer walking with the eyesight of the things of this world, our personal opinions, but we have such a grace, a consecration upon our person that we are walking in unity with Christ. We are the church. Amen. And it says in verse 3, It is like the dew of lofty Mount Hermon and the dew that comes on the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, even life forevermore, upon the high and the lowly. And so we see that all of unity, it brings a blessing of what? Life. A blessing of life. So before we get to Isaiah 61, 1 Peter 4, Matthew 10, we do have a lot of scriptures to cover, amen. We're going to look at this Psalm 133, this unity, amen. We need to see as Holy Spirit brings us understanding, we're going to see what unity looks like. Amen. And so let's look at this particular word, unity, and let's see what it is in Hebrew. It is yachad, and it means united, unity, alike. It means likewise, with all, together. And then it comes from the Hebrew word yachad, which looks very similar, and it means to become one, to join, to unite, that although you are an individual, that just like troops going out to battle, they're all made of soldiers, generals, captains. You've got all the different people in the battle but they're all as one army. And that is a good analogy about the all of unity. We all have different functions. We all have our own individuality, but we have one common goal, amen? And so let's look at the three Hebrew letters, yachad, yud, chet, which is chet, and delet. I love this. Oh my goodness, this is so powerful because look at this. Yud is the arm at work, Y-O-O-D, and it means works, it means deeds, and then chet, C-H-E-T, is the ancient symbol of a fence or a chamber, and it means to separate, and it also means secret place, and then we have delet, D-A-L-E-T, and it's the ancient symbol of a door, and it means to enter, and it means pathway, and so the word picture for unity is the works where you are separated in the secret place and you have entered the path. You've gone through the door. Oh my goodness. Is this not powerful because we're leaving 2020 
and we're going over to 2021 and God has just put it on my heart. Robin, wherever there is discord in this hour, cut it off and pursue peace. Pursue peace with all men and pursue holiness with God, right? That's scripture. And so now let's look at Matthew 10 and let's look at the instances in which you put up boundaries. Boundaries are safe. They're to protect you. When I was an outpatient psychotherapist, I taught boundaries. I love boundaries. And I actually went in the late 1990s here in Birmingham, Alabama, when Dr. Henry Cloud came to Birmingham and he did the boundaries workshops I attended. And it just did so much for me personally as a single mother and I took that boundary teaching and I took Dr. Cloud's books, his workbooks, his audio tapes, and I brought that into the profession and I made a compact course that I taught both in individual and in group. Boundaries put up fences. What makes good neighbors? Fences. What keeps your peace? Fences. Okay. And that represents boundaries. And so Jesus in John 14, 27 came to leave us a peace. He leaves us an undisturbed peace, not that the world gives, but a peace that comes from the Father. And that peace is an undisturbed peace. In fact, as we get ready to get into Matthew 10, let's read that John 14, 27 scripture. And let's see the context in which it's delivered. Because understand that Jesus, he is pouring into his disciples. I love John 12 through John 17. Those are some of my favorite chapters. And especially when you get to John 14. And it's as though Jesus is pouring everything into his disciples. He knows he has very little time with them. And to me, these are some of the most powerful chapters that I love to read over and over because it is what he is giving instruction for as we get ready to see the church rise up. Amen. And so John 14, 27, Jesus is preparing his disciples. Look, things are about to happen, but I am giving you a peace so you will not be disturbed, but you will walk in that undisturbed peace, and that peace is a keeping peace. And saints, that's where we are in this hour. We are in a place where we need a keeping peace, a keeping grace, and it only comes when we are in that undisturbed peace. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My own peace I now give and bequeath to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. So when we look at the peace that Jesus gives to us, we're to guard it and we're not to let it be agitated. We're not to let the enemy cause us to lose this peace. This peace is not as the world gives. That is a temporary fix where we feel good all of a sudden for a moment. This peace surpasses all understanding. When all of hell is going off around you, that you have a firm footedness. You are fully established and empowered by the word of hope, of truth in Christ Jesus. And you are not shaken. You are not moved. And this is that kind of peace. And this is what you have to guard. It is this peace where you come into the unity of the faith with other brethren, with other sistren. When we come together, and I love my husband's father had been, my husband was born in ministry. His dad was a, an Episcopal priest and he left the Episcopal priesthood when things began to change in the Episcopal church. 
and he went into the Anglican Michigan missions of America from the Rwanda diocese. And I just love how when I go to those meetings and we visited in the past when we went to Virginia, that one of the things that we would do that Rich's dad would have us do was he would stop for a moment and he would have us go around and greet other people and we would say, peace be with you, peace be with you. And it was about giving peace and sharing peace. And we're going to see that in Matthew 10 because the litmus test, the litmus test to let you know that you're in the will of the Father, to let you know if you are in Holy Spirit, the litmus test is no matter what, you're going to have peace. God will have you do very difficult things, very hard things, but in the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the hardship, in the midst of the suffering, you have perfect peace because that peace guards your heart and it guards your mind. Amen. And so let's look at Matthew 10 and the instances in which you would operate in cutting someone off for whatever reason. And the main thing is to guard your peace. We do not realize, as I've been teaching about the mind and the body, Romans 12, 1, make a decisive dedication over your body, consecrated as holy as unto God, which is your reasonable worship. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, to prove what is the acceptable will of God, even that which is pleasing to the Father. Amen. And so our mind has thoughts and our body has emotions. They communicate to each other. And it's in the language of fruit. Matthew 12, 33, you shall know a tree by what? It's fruit. So in my new book, Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ, I get into the revelation as God has unpacked the scriptures and shown me the language of fruit. Because fruit equals what? Works. What does Jesus say to the seven churches in the book of Revelation? I know your what? Works. He's saying, I know your fruit. That although you might be doing this, and this looks really good, and you're calling out the false apostles, and you're doing all these other good things. I know your works. I know your fruits. You've left your first love, right? He calls it like it is. And the fruits that we have is the connection that is indicating in the spirit realm where the mind and the body connect and they speak their own language and we will see this largely expressed in what can be called an emotion, but it's not just something that's felt in the body. It's something that's also experienced in the mind. And so when we look at the word peace, let's look at it from the avenue of the Hebrew word peace, shalom. It means to restore what is missing. It means peace. It also means restitution. It means to make whole. So anything that you need, that peace, that shalom will bring it. Amen. In fact, let me get to that word, peace. And let me get to the con, not the context, but let me get to one of the Hebrew words for peace. I want to bring that up just to make sure that I covered everything in there. So the word shalom we see that it means prosperity, peace, fair, favor, rest, safety, welfare. All is well. This comes from the Hebrew word shalem. And the Hebrew word shalem means requite, restitution, restore, reward. It means to recompense. It means peace that is perfect. It means to reciprocate. It means to pay to make good. And what we're going to see today, when the vengeance of the Lord comes, that His peace is going to be upon His people 
And the way that the analogy that I can give it to you so that you can kind of understand it in the proverbial sort is imagine the atomic bomb and how you see it just go up in fire and that smoke blow out. But now imagine peace that all of a sudden peace is like that atomic bomb and it hits the church. It hits God's people and it just explodes. And its radar is to go to Romans 9.23 to those vessels of honor created for God's glory. And that's what it's targeting and it's going to fill them. And all of a sudden when this peace manifests, you first and foremost have a message and that message is the message of Christ. Amen. And this peace is his message and it testifies and witnesses that we are a part of that royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. It is the witness of our salvation as we walk in peace. And that is why scripture says in Matthew 12, 33, You shall know a tree by its fruit because the enemy, for those that are not in the Lord, but they're in the church and they think they're saved or either they know they're not saved and they're just a willing pawn of the enemy. They are going to bring division and do everything against the peace of God because it is that peace that binds us all together as the church. It's not the four walls of a building that keep us all together as a church. It is the binding power of peace. And you feel it in your body when you have that calmness, that feeling of wholeness, like it says right here, that feeling of reward. Like like God said in Genesis 15, 1, Abraham, fear not. For I am your exceeding, Abram, fear not, for I am your exceeding great reward. And I can see that reward being this shalom, peace. So peace, the root word, means to recompense, to requite. It means restitution. That's Joel 2.25. And it means to restore. That's Joel 2.25. It means to reward. And so the vengeance of God is not what most people think where it is just him bringing wrath and he's coming against sinners where he's bringing judgment to his house. That's not what this is. What this is is where God does Psalm 23 and he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies where your enemies will know the blessings of the God on your life. And there is now a reward. There is a requiting. There's restoration. So God is just turning things around in your life. We're in these seasons where we've been tried and tested. First Peter 1, 6, and 7. And we are in the fire and the testing of our faith. Like as Israel in Isaiah, there's probably many times to other people we look cursed. But we're not cursed. We're just the remnant. Okay? And we're being purified. And the main thing that God is purifying us for is the consecration, like we just saw earlier in Psalm 133, of the body, of the church. And we're going to be doing a fast starting June 4th. And it is a consecration. It's 1 Peter 1 and 1 Peter 5, which means that God is going to have me focus on reading those chapters during the fast. I will read whatever else the Lord leads me to read. But my main focus, and it's because I had a dream about two weeks ago, and in the dream, God kept telling me, Robin, 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 5, and it was a time for now. And so that's the fast that we're going to start, and it's a consecration where we are preparing ourselves And I am truly humbled and expectant knowing that God is going to bring peace. Shalom. Amen. 
So now let's look at Matthew 10 and let's look at how it seems as guarding your peace. Because a lot of people think that it's being ugly, it's being rude. It's not being ugly, it's not being rude when you're gentle and you're doing it by scripture. And you can still be bold and do it by scripture, just like Jesus Christ. And just guard your peace. Amen. So let's look at Matthew 10 and let's start in verse 10. Matthew 10 verse 10. And this was also in my dream where he was telling me 1 Peter 1 and 5. Because in the dream, I was in this church and all these people were getting their purses and stuff like that. And I couldn't find my purse. And God said, don't take a purse. Don't get a purse. 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 5. He said... I will provide for you. Amen. So, Matthew 10, 10. And do not take... This is like my dream. Oh, my goodness. And do not take a provision bag, a purse in some translations, or a wallet for a collection bag for your journey, nor two undergarments, nor sandals, nor staff, for the workman deserves his support, his living, his food. And into whatever town or village you go, inquire who in it is deserving and stay at the at his house until you leave the vicinity. And as you go into the house, give your greetings and wish it well. Then if indeed that house is deserving, if it is deserving, let come upon it your peace. That is freedom from all distresses that are experienced as the result of sin. But if it is not deserving, let your peace return to you. Do you see this, saints of God? This peace that we have been given by Jesus Christ, this undisturbedness, it is something that we can give away. It is the message of the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so... When we give that message, and it doesn't have to be preached, it is simply you being who you are in Christ. With your personality, doing whatever God's called you to do, whether it's nursing, whether it's a student, whether it's a stay-at-home mom, whether it's a businessman, businesswoman, whatever it is, a minister, whatever it is, you're just being who you are in Christ. And you're being authentic to the will of the Father. And you're seeking to do His will. As you're seeking to do the will of the Father. And you're going out. As He leads you to go to just different places. Whether it be your job. Whether it be this. Then we see right here. Now remember. We're going to look at this. In relation to the church. So we're going to find out. That there's two groups within the church. There are the sheep and the goat. There are the wheat and the tares. And we see the parable about them growing up together. So it is for certain that there is instances when we are going to be so stretched by the thorns of the messengers of Satan that are sent to buffet our flesh. And we're going to see here specifically about guarding our peace so that if when our peace goes out and understand that this says a house, but we're going to liken this to the church. And again, I am not bashing churches. I'm being authentic and I'm being real because I care about somebody's life because I've seen enough damage done that I do not want anyone to take their life, to consider harming themselves because they their spirit has been crushed by someone in the church and they never got this teaching. They never ha heard how to do something scripturally as it relates to putting up boundaries. And so I am preaching this message specifically for those that are in need so that you are not spiritually abused and you do not tolerate abuse. You don't tolerate it, but you put up boundaries. And Jesus shows us here how to put up boundaries. Verse 13 again, 
then if indeed that house is deserving, and let's say that that ministry, that church is deserving, you join in and you're giving your peace, you're coming as who you are, and you're loving them, and don't use the excuse that there is no perfect church. I do not want to hear that excuse. That allows spiritual abuse. It allows immaturity. And it does not call into accountability those that are in leadership. And as a leader in a ministry, I can tell you, I fear and tremble about standing before the judgment seat of Christ because I've read James 3. I read the book of James just to remind me of the fear of the Lord as a minister of the gospel and especially one that ministers to the souls of other people because I know that it is going to be on my hands whatever I did or did not do and that will be required of me. And so do not give me the excuse that there is no perfect church. That is just a lie of Satan to try to get us to settle for less than. And there is just impotence, no power in the church because we have allowed these excuses. And it is time for the real church, the remnant, to rise up. And we are going to rise up in the peace of Jesus Christ, unified in the faith, because we love one another. Amen. So let's look at verse 13. Then if indeed that house is deserving, let come upon it your peace. That is freedom from all the distresses that are experienced as the result of sin. So there's no torment. The Holy Spirit is upon you. So all of a sudden, when someone's in your presence, and I felt this, I've, I've seen it. So I'm, I've witnessed this. I know what Jesus is talking about here. That when they're in, their, in your presence, that shalom, that peace brings an intermediate reprieve. It brings just such a wholeness for the moment that that person knows, I don't know what is on them, what they have, but glory to God, whatever they have, that is what I want. Because it is the tangible presence of God that is in and upon your person. And that's the language of fruit. Where your fruit in your body and in your mind is peace, unity. Amen. So verse 14. And whoever will not receive and accept and welcome you. So Jesus is clear. He is saying, now look, if they're just, if, if some of them are receiving and welcoming you, but the others are not. He, he's clear. He is clear, okay? There's no ambiguity. And I wish I would have had this when I was going through my persecution because I could tell you that I would have so appreciated this kind of teaching because I did not have people speaking into my life at that moment where they could just reassure and affirm scripture where I knew that I was in, I was feeling in my heart and in my belly, this scripture right here, and that I should leave. And instead, other people would say, no, Robin, you know, you need to just, you know, there's no perfect charge. That, no, if there is James 3.16, every evil work, if there is division, if there's jealousy, if there's contention, then there is every evil work. Leave. Do not stay there. Okay? And I know I get a lot of persecution because of that. I get a lot of churches and people that hate me, ministers, pastors, because I will have people come to me that are in utter torment from what is going on. And it is James 3.16. And we are not to tolerate that because our peace is is disturbed. We do not have the presence of God. You cannot have the presence of God if you have James 3.16 in your church because the peace of God is the presence of God. And sin is covered up with James 3.16 and people just do whatever they think they're doing and they think they're right with God 
but they can be so tormented in their inner man and they know that their fruits are not that of Holy Spirit because they have contempt against others in Christ Jesus. The true remnant, as God had me preach a couple weeks ago, the true remnant is the persecuted church. The church within the building, okay? The church within the building. I'm not going to say the church within the church. It's the church within the building. That as it says in Isaiah 16, Isaiah 66, if we get there, in Jeremiah 5, which we probably won't, we just don't have enough time, that the real church is cast out. They cast you out of God's presence, they think, and they think that they're doing the work of God, but it is not God with them. And in fact, this is going to have to be two, two teachings because it is going to be so in-depth, and we still have not even touched Isaiah 61. But let's get again to uh, Matthew 10, 14. And whoever will not receive and accept and welcome you, nor listen to your message, as you leave that house or town, shake the dust of it from your feet. Truly I tell you, it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I am sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wary and wise as serpents and be innocent, be harmless, guileless without falsity as doves. Be on guard against men whose way or nature is to act in opposition to God, for they will deliver you to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a witness to bear testimony before them and to the Gentile nations. But when they deliver you up, do not be anxious about how or what you're to speak. For what you are to say will be given to you in the very hour and moment. For it is not you who are speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver up brother to death, and father his child, and children will take a stand against their parents, and will have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who perseveres and endures to the end will be saved from spiritual dis-ease and death in the world to come. When they persecute you in one town, that is pursue you in a manner that would injure you and cause you to suffer because of your belief, flee to another town. For I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor is a slave above his master. It is sufficient for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant or slave like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, master of the dwelling, how much more will they speak evil of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is concealed that will not be revealed or kept secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered in the ear. Proclaim upon the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather be afraid of him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And saints, as we get ready to end, because I see our time is going short, we still have First Peter 4. And in fact, we'll get to 1 Peter 4, but we still have Isaiah 61, which we'll get to in the next broadcast, because it's going to leave you with so much hope. When you see, when you see what this season is going to look like, the peace of God is going to visit your house, and you are going to feel such 
restoration, restitution, wholeness. You're going to feel God just coming upon your person and that he is your reward and he is making everything right. And that is what his vengeance looks like where everything that has worked against you in the past, in one moment, it is just turned around and God brings the wealth of his peace and it covers you and it fills you and it becomes what? That Psalm 27, four and five tenth. In fact, we'll read that. We'll end with that before we, instead of ending with uh, 1 Peter 4. That's where we're going to go. Glory to God. Let's go to Psalm 27. In fact, all of Psalm 27 is perfect for what God is showing us. You have to guard your peace because that peace is the sanctuary of God. It is His house. And in that peace, as we come together and we fellowship with one another, however that looks like, in that fellowship, there is a witness, an inward witness of the Spirit to that peace and one another. That even if you come on this broadcast and you've been disturbed and you've been downcast, glory to God, the peace of God is going to bring wholeness. It is going to bring reprieve. It is going to bring hope. It is going to preach the message of the gospel of Christ Jesus where his peace just goes forth. Hallelujah. And isn't that what was spoken by the angels? Woo! In fact, we're going to end with that too. The angels in Luke 2, peace on earth, peace on earth and goodwill to men. Woo! Hallelujah. Let's, let's do first Psalm 27 and then we will do Luke. Amen. Psalm 27 and then we'll do Luke 2, 14. Psalm 27. The Lord is is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear or dread? The Lord is the refuge and the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies, and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, even then will I be confident. Woo! One thing have I asked of the Lord. That will I seek, inquire for, and insistently require. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. In His presence. That's the peace. Hallelujah. All the days of my life to behold and gaze upon the beauty the sweet attractiveness and the delightful loveliness of the Lord and to meditate and consider and inquire in his temple. For in the day of trouble, here it is, he will hide me in his shelter and in the secret place of his tent, he will hide me and he will set me high upon a rock and now shall my head be lifted above my enemies around about me in his tent I will offer sacrifices and shouting of joy Woo! nothing can steal our peace I will sing yes I will sing praises to the Lord here O Lord when I cry aloud have mercy and be gracious to me and answer me you have said, seek my face, inquire for, require my presence. Woo, his peace has your vital need. Give us an IV, Lord, woo, of peace. Hallelujah. Vital need, my heart says to you, your face, your presence, Lord, will I seek, inquire for, and require of necessity on the authority of your word. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, cast me not off, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. Verse 11, teach me your way, O Lord, 
and lead me. That's that door that we did with Yahad, that Hebrew word, with unity. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in the plain and even path. Remember, delet also means path. Because of my enemies, those who lie in wait for me, give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen up against me. They breathe out cruelty and violence. What would have become of me had I not believed that I would see the Lord's goodness, that's his peace, hallelujah, in the land of the living. Woo, that's unity. Wait and hope for and expect the Lord. Be brave and of good courage and let your heart be stout and enduring. Yes, wait for and hope for and expect the Lord. Woo! Saints, did you see this? That tent of his presence, that sanctuary of God is his peace. And this is where we're going to end in Luke 2, 14. Luke 2, 14, amen. Luke 2, where we see the angels and they herald and they declare, amen. Luke 2, 14, in fact, let's start in verse 13. Then suddenly there appeared with the angel an army of the troops of heaven, a heavenly knighthood praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace woo, among men with whom he is well pleased, men of good will and of favor. Do you see this, saints of God? That good will and favor that the Father has given you and I is His peace, His shalom. So I pray that you walk in wisdom and as in Matthew 10, that you are gentle as a dove, you're wise as a serpent, you guard the peace of God in you, which is His sanctuary. His peace is His church, His sanctuary. Woo! Amen, Melissa. His peace is his sanctuary. And it's so funny because I have not seen anything until now. Melissa, you're the first comment that I've seen. I think there's something going on with Facebook Live. But I haven't seen anybody that's on. It's not showing me who's on. It's just showing me a couple people. But isn't it funny? At the end of the message, finally something comes on. And all I can think of is the sanctuary and presence of God is his peace, saints of God. So know that the real church, hallelujah, is the remnant. The real church is the persecuted church. And so this is part one, and we'll come back next week, and I won't be on till Wednesday, because actually Rich and I will be out of town going to Asheville, and I won't be home till late Monday, so I will be back on Wednesday of next week. But I just pray the peace of God over you. I pray that Holy Spirit bring the understanding and knowledge and wisdom of God to you to show you resurrection power in your heart, which is your inheritance, and to flood you with the light of that resurrection power. And I just pray the peace. Hey, amen, Debbie. I just pay, pray the peace of God. Guard your heart and that you are like Jesus. You are jealous for his house and you're jealous for that peace, that undisturbed peace and that you open your mouth when Holy Spirit feels it and you speak what the Spirit of the Lord, the living God says in Jesus name and I just pray that you know that the church is not a building, but the church is the people. And for those of y'all who are out there that are hungry for fellowship, I just pray that God opens a door that no man can shut for his fellowship of people in your life. For you to feel the presence of the oil of unity and for y'all to break bread and fellowship together. And saints of God, I would encourage you. I know 
that there are many regulations in many states and cities, and I do not know the regulations in your area, but if you get, we see people out here all the time at the parks, they're six feet away, and they have chairs, and they're six feet away, but, th but there's fellowship, they're coming together, and acknowledge one another, and value one another, because the church is the presence of the peace of God. And if any time it was needed in the world, it is this time. And so I just challenge each and every person that by the time before the end of the year comes, you reach out on purpose and you be fellowship, you be peace, and you bring the presence of God to the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I love you. Renee, God knew. I love you. God bless you all.